church and welcome. Today is a little bit more of a casual service. Uh, we just had Christmas and uh, we thought that we would just gather here in front of the fireplace and worship together. So I do want to welcome you. Thank you for taking, um, taking time out of your morning uh, to come together as a church family and to worship God. In our call to worship this morning, we have an opportunity to think back to the events of Christmas that we celebrated only a couple days ago and lift our hearts and enjoy them with the words of the psalmist who in Psalm 118 writes, The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. And so as we begin our worship time, we do it acknowledging that God greets us with these words from 2 Peter. To those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our call to confession this morning comes from Psalm 32, and here the psalmist testifies, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away, through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. In the strength of this assurance, let us confess our sin to God. Would you please join me in a time of prayerful confession? Eternal God, who can make all things new, we 
humbly bring before you the record of our lives in the year now ending. Where life has been good to us, we give you thanks and praise. Where we have been good to others, may our reward be your smiling face. Where we have fallen short of your good pleasure, forgive us and free us from our sinful past. Holy God, cleanse us by your mercy. Guide us by your truth. Fill us with your love and lead us forward in hope through the grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. People of God, hear this assurance of pardon from 1 Peter chapter 2. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. For by his wounds you have been healed. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sin is forgiven. Join with me in a time of prayer for our congregation and our community. Almighty God and gracious Father, in your goodness and grace, we ask that you hear the prayers of your people. Look upon your people and our struggle upon the earth. May your mercy and grace renew our strength and cover our weaknesses. Uphold us and sustain us as we come before the throne to receive mercy and grace to help in our time of need. We continue to remember that the Christmas and holiday season is a difficult time for many. We lift up those in our congregation and community who find themselves feeling lonely or alone. We remember that Christ came to bind up the brokenhearted. And may your presence bring comfort as we ask that you guard us and keep us in you. We pray for those who find themselves ending this year living in the bitterness of regret. Although often unseen, we experience a profoundly deep pain when a relationship is broken. The hurt is real and the cure often seems beyond our reach or beyond all hope. Please bring hope and healing to the heartbroken. May we remember that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, and there is no person or relationship that is beyond your reach or your repair. Where there is darkness and despair, may your love shine brightly. We also realize that suffering is part of this life, a 
the part that we often don't wish to dwell on until it touches us personally. Yet we remember that suffering is a part of life that you know intimately. And so we come to you, Lord Jesus, remembering the suffering you endured on our behalf and ask that you would grant strength, peace, patience, and perseverance to those who live with pain, disappointment, frustration. Renew us in our spirits, even when our bodies are not being renewed. We ask this knowing that many in our church are struggling with illness or chronic pain or ongoing health issues, and there are those who are hospitalized or waiting for medical procedures. Keep us in the knowledge of your tender care and grant healing and the gift of your indwelling peace. And finally, we again lift up the brokenness of our world in our own hearts, in our homes, in our communities, in our state, in our nation, and throughout the world. Once again, we remember that the rest, that we rest in the truth that Jesus came as the Messiah to bring justice, righteousness, and peace to a rebellious, broken, and dying people. And now to him who is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 2. I'll begin in verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem and Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the chief, people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we gather in worship today, we pray that you would open our hearts, open our eyes, Lord, to see where you are leading us in your scriptures. Help us to receive uh, these words as good news to us um, as they are meant to be. We pray this in your name. Amen. Now, this first Sunday after Christmas is still officially the Christmas season, at least according to the church calendar. And if you're anything like us, I'm sure that things probably still look pretty Christmassy in many of your homes with leftover Christmas dinner, Christmas cookies, maybe some toys scattered everywhere. Often, even in more liturgical churches, this Sunday and the next lead into what is called Epiphany, which is when the story of the wise men or the Magi is traditionally told. And in that spirit, and also because this year we had this amazing occurrence of Jupiter and Saturn lining up in the sky. Did any of you get to see that? Um, I've seen some pictures. We kind of missed out on it. It was a little too cloudy. Um, but we had this, you know, the, the Christmas star was in the sky this year. So I thought it would only be fitting to just very quickly share just one more reflection on this part of the Christmas story. Now, the this, this scripture passage today, the story of the Magi, the three wise men, they come to visit Jesus. It's most likely a very familiar story to you, at least to many. Um, but the way that I want to look at the story today is actually by noticing, by examining how each group in this story reacts to the news that Jesus is born. 
So we're going to take things a little bit out of order, but don't let that distract you. The first person we're going to look at is King Herod. Now, at the time of Jesus' birth, Herod was the one referred to as the king of the Jews or the king of Israel. Now, he wasn't the king in the same way that, for example, King David or King Solomon were the kings of Israel. Herod was more of a a puppet king. He was put into his position by the Roman Empire, and he was expected to carry out their agenda. But even though he was under Roman authority, he was still a very powerful figure in the region. Now, what we're told is the Magi, they see this star, and they somehow know that they need to go to Israel and find this king that they somehow discern is being born. The only problem is they don't quite know exactly where in Israel this new king is supposed to be. So they do the most logical thing. There's a new king in Israel. Where would you expect to find him? Probably in the capital. So that's where they go. They go to Jerusalem and they ask the current king, King Herod, hey, where's this new king? We saw his star and we're here to see him. And of course, this was pretty big news to Herod. He thought he was the king. So how did he react? Again, in Matthew 2, verse 3, (coughs) when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. So Herod was disturbed. He was deeply disturbed. The Bible tells us that Herod did two things after this. First, he summons the chief priests and the scholars together to try to figure out if there really was something to what these foreign wise men were talking about. And then he hatches this plan to try to take this new king, this new rival power, to take him out. Later on, we find out that Herod goes to the terrible lengths to try to eliminate this new king of the Jews, going so far as to even kill every male child that was born around the same time that the star appeared in the sky. So this is Herod's reaction to this news of Jesus' birth. He recognizes the threat that Jesus poses to his own power, and he tries to reject Jesus in the most severe, terrible way possible by putting him to death. Now listen, I don't want to undermine the scope of Herod's evil here. I can't even fathom when you read that passage in the Bible of the anguish and the mourning of these mothers, of these families. As a father myself, it's, it's just unthinkable. But that being said, we also need to acknowledge that Herod's reaction to Jesus is not unique. Herod's rejection of Jesus is in fact a terrible, visible display of what we have all done to Christ in our own hearts. We have all put Christ to death out of a desire to be our own lords, to be our own kings. After all, this is what sin ultimately is. Sin is rejecting God. Sin is rejecting God's rightful place of lordship in our lives. As sinful human beings, we have all reacted to Jesus in exactly the same way, by choosing our own power and our own authority over God's. Scholars now tell us that the earliest Christian creed, the earliest public proclamation that Christians would say about themselves was the simple statement, Jesus is Lord. Why is it that this statement, why was this statement that the early Christians proclaimed, why was this the thing that they chose to say to set themselves apart? It's because they knew, just as we know today, that the greatest struggle in the human heart is to give over our control to God. This is something that is so important for us to remember, especially at this time of year when the stresses of the holiday season can feel so overwhelming, and again, especially this year. When work deadlines are coming due, when finances seem to tighten up, when squabbles with family members blow up, when we feel too lonely, too busy, too imperfect, it's in these moments it will do us well to pause for a moment, to be still, and to remember that Jesus is Lord. Not you, not me. Jesus is Lord. 
This brings us now to the second group that I want to focus on today, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. Now, this is a really interesting group in the story, at least to me. Of everyone Matthew mentions here, the wise men, King Herod, it's the chief priests and the scribes that should know the most about this coming king. After all, this is why Herod gets them together, to ask them where the Messiah is supposed to be born. And what's crazy is they know the answer, right? It's pretty impressive, actually. They are able to quote a passage from the prophet Micah that foretells of the Messiah being born in Bethlehem, in this backwater town, not too far from Jerusalem, but not the place that you would expect. But here's the thing that is so confusing about the chief priests and the scribes. That's all they do in this story, right? The wise men come, they say they're looking for this new king. Herod asks the priests and the scribes where the wise men should look, and then that's it. In other words, the chief priests and the scribes, they react to the news of Jesus' birth pretty much with indifference. And why? Why do they react this way? We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But if we ask the same question to ourselves, I think we can begin to think of some reasons why we often react to the news of Jesus' birth with indifference. Now, for some people, they may react to the news of Jesus' birth with indifference because they don't actually think that it matters, right? What does it matter that one more baby is being born? I don't think that that was what was going on with the scribes and Pharisees in all likelihood. For many of us, though, especially those of us who have grown up in the Christian church, this celebration of Christmas, this celebration of Jesus' birth it may have become a somewhat empty tradition or a tradition that is filled with so many other distractions, we kind of forget what the main point is, right? We know the ins and outs of the story. We can tell you what the angels said to the shepherds as they watched their flocks by night, but we've forgotten the reasons for the joy. We've forgotten the excitement that that proclamation brought. And if I had to guess that might be what's going on with these chief priests and scribes, right? For them, they know everything there is to know about the Messiah. They know the Bible backward and forward. They can quote passage and verse of the prophecies to tell you where the Messiah is to be born. And yet, it's like it's just an empty tradition. It's not something to get excited about. It's not something to drop everything and follow the wise men to Bethlehem to see this child that maybe, just maybe, could be the one who was born to fulfill these prophecies. And that's what I love so much about this story of the Magi, about the wise men. Because their reaction is the complete and polar opposite of what we see with the chief priests and the scribes. Rather than indifference, we see in the Magi a reaction of joy and worship, right? These Magi, these astrologers from the East, probably from Babylon of all places. If you know anything about Babylon in the Bible, this is not where you would expect people traveling, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of miles to try to find the king of the Jews, you certainly would not expect them to be coming from Babylon of all places. And yet these magi, as they're looking up at the stars, they see this astonishing thing. We don't exactly know what this star is that they see, right? This star that they somehow associate with the birth of a new king of the Jews. And we don't even know why they would care about a new king of the Jews. I mean, have you ever thought about that? Why should they care about the king of the Jews? They aren't even Jewish. And yet, it is clear that God has worked on their hearts in some way that we know is important, that they know that this is important. They know that this is probably the most important event that will ever happen in their lives. And so they drop everything to make this incredible journey to a foreign land. They journey to a foreign capital to try to work out where this child is. And then while they're searching for this child king, they see the star again, 
this star that somehow leads them to where Jesus is. And I love this point. The scripture says, this is in verse 10, it says, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Now that's how the NIV translates it. In actual fact, that translation somewhat downplays what the Greek says here. In the Greek, it's something closer to this. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Right? They aren't just overjoyed. They are rejoicing exceedingly with not just joy, with great joy. That's how excited the Magi are. It's as if they somehow know that in this child, all of their hopes, all of their fears, all of their needs, all of their longings, all of those have been met in this child and fulfilled. And that's where we see the gospel in the most powerful way in the story, I think. These magi, they're foreign astrologers. Of all the people in the story, they are the least qualified to know anything about Jesus. And yet, and yet God comes to these magi. He meets them right where they are. God uses the stars. God uses the magi's false beliefs in these stars to meet them and to reveal to them his amazing plan and his overwhelming love for them. A plan that he had, that God had to have had in mind from the very first time that he created the stars themselves, that they would line up in just the right way so that these three magi would see it at the right time and desire, have this deep longing and desire to go and see the king. That is what we see here. We see God's overwhelming love for these, these wise men, these magi. And then God sends them on this incredible journey. God uses them as the messengers to tell the world that Jesus is born. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas. We celebrate that just like the Magi, God meets us where we are. We can't become perfect for God, so God became a man for us. God came to us in our humanity. He spoke to us in the only way that we could understand by giving his life for us. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas. That's what it means for us that Jesus is born. It means that God has come to us when we we could not come to him. And that indeed is a cause to rejoice exceedingly with great joy. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, during this Christmas season, I pray just once more, you would remind us of just how much you love us that no matter where we are, Lord, you can reach us. From the beginning of time, you have been calling out to us. And in your calling, Lord, you help us, you guide us along the way so that we can meet you as you have met us. We pray all this in your name. Amen.
And now we're going to transition into an essential part of our worship this morning as we respond to the goodness and greatness of Jesus Christ through the act of our giving. And with our service happening entirely online this morning, we do encourage you to give using our website and navigating to our giving page. You may also text your gift to the number 84321, and you are always welcome to mail your offering into the church office. And it has long been the tradition at Seymour Church that, that we will take up two collections this morning. Our special offering will go towards supporting the ongoing work of Guiding Light Ministries. And so we do invite you to give with joy and generosity as you are able. And so with open hands and open hearts, we dedicate this offering through prayer this morning. Gracious God, all that we are and all that we have comes from you. And so in gratitude for all of your gifts, we offer you ourselves all that we have and all that we are in union with Christ's offering for us. Receive these gifts from us as an act of our worship and a sign of our trust. Through them, bring life and hope to many. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. People of God at Seymour Church, I invite you to receive this morning's benediction. May the tender mercy of our God shine on those living in darkness and guide our feet to the path of peace. Go in peace, Seymour Church. church, we have a very special gift and a special presentation for you. This is a very small scale, uh, low budget production of a Christmas pageant given to you as a gift from your staff here at Seymour Church. Finally done with Wise Man School. Oh, that was rough. Hey, hey, good news, good news. What? Uh, what, what is uh, it? There, there, oh, are the Yankees gonna win again? She said news, not fantasy. Well, it's not like I said the Cubs were gonna win. Hey, ah! hey, the Cubs winning, that would be good news. But this is something better than that. What? If you look over here, there's an azimuth of Jupiter. And there's an alignment following the decline of the Martian orbit in oh. the zenith of Venus. Oh! Whoa. Oh, come on. It's a it's an alignment of the Martian orbit in the zenith of Venus. And oh, come on, it's the star out there. The yeah. star. Oh, yeah. the star. Oh. Ah. Okay. And ah. you know what that means? Yeah. Uh. It means a king has been born! A king! Oh, a king! A king! The king the biggest thing in centuries! Oh, you know oh. what? You know what? what? We, we must go and we need to bring gifts. Gifts? Gifts! Of, yeah. Great idea. Of gold okay. and frankincense okay. and myrrh. Let's go! Let's okay. go! Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! A few minutes later.
graduate from wise man school is beyond me. Beyond me. Here it is. Oh. I think we're ready. And now to leave, we need to travel light and fast. Okay. Many light and fast. fast. Let's go get our stuff. Hey, Got it. Many, many minutes later. What do you got here again? Presume in a palace? We have three blocks from the east. 
Last week. Oh. I think they packed him off to Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Try right there. All right. Be on. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, I don't believe it. I thought we had arrived. I thought we had found the new king. No. I have to keep traveling to Bethlehem with you two. Our journey will continue because it is right that we should seek this king. A king for whom the stars shine, even the big shiny one. A king that all should seek, wise men, wise women, rich, poor, young and old. Many will journey. Some will find him, some will find the journey too difficult. I, I didn't know he knew such big words. So come, let us seek the promised king, our Emmanuel. Yes. Let's seek yes. him diligently. Yes. Yes. yes, yes, yes. Let's go. Let's go.